Jai Guru, everybody. Jai Guru. Jai Guru. Jai Guru. Welcome to the fourth and final part of chapter two. Um, we got there in quite quick succession, actually, uh, for this for this chapter, but we do have a potential bonus episode to follow. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail toward the end of this episode. Um, so really, we're at the end of a very magical chapter. Now, in this episode, we're, we're going to dive into the finale um, of, of chapter two. So Paramahansa Yogananda's mother's message to young Mukunda, uh, retelling a story of a strange sadhu and gifting who gifted her a, a, an amulet. Um, now, this in turn she gave to Paramahansa Yogananda with specific instructions as to how and when to do so. So we're going to delve into all of that. And we'll finish uh, the chapter, of course, by looking at uh, how Paramahansa Yogananda responded to receiving the amulet, some of his reflections. Um, we actually have a correction to do from the last episode. I'll, I'll get into that as well um, shortly. Um, I suppose listeners, viewers, um, followers of the Yogananda podcast, if you do want to do some homework, um, what I would say in real time, if you are able to, you want to pause and read, um, please feel free to do so. So this episode will start from, it was an interview with a sage in the Punjab. So we're going to start from there. We're going to read. So if you want to read along, think about what talking points you would wish to discuss, uh, feel free to suggest them in the comments. YouTube is a pretty good place to, to reach out to us. Mm -hmm. If you want to comment and say, maybe, you know, we missed something or, you, you know, we, we could talk about something, uh, add to the conversation. It'd be really nice to hear from you. We have so many people reaching out already. So thanks to those people who, who do. And, you know, I would encourage anybody else uh, who hasn't to, to do so. It's really nice to hear from everybody. Um, all righty. So that's what we what we can look forward to by and large in this in this episode. And we do want to recap, uh, summarize the chapter at the end with some reflections on how we think uh, this chapter has gone in our coverage of it and um, what to look forward to in the next chapter. So all that said, let's let's uh, kick off, shall we? Um, so we can split this part into various aspects. So. The first one we think really we can talk about the, the sadhu, this sadhu who the strange sadhu as he was described, um, uh, by looking really at, at the um, definition of it essentially. So, whilst uh, Yogananda's family they were living in Lahore, um, it says here that one one morning um, the servant that they had came in to talk to uh, Yogananda's mother. And he said that uh, he was insistent, really, on on seeing the mother mother of Mukunda. So that was that was how he requested to to uh, to yeah be in the presence of Yogananda's mother. Um, now the the message that she she was to go to see the sadhu struck a a chord, a profound chord within her, and we'll we'll talk about that. Uh, but let's first look at. Um, the, the very beginning, the first talking point that we have is the sadhu and sages. This word sages uh, is mentioned as well. And I suppose starting on this journey, I didn't really know what sage was or sadhu was. And, you know, I kind of thought, well, it's a kind of yogi or a type of, you know, uh, character that devotes their life to God or something like this. But um, a sage for, for, for definition as such is um, a profound philosopher. You can find this online. Essentially, it's distinguished uh, for for wisdom, a mature or venerable person of sound judgment, and a sadhu. Um, there's a, a male and female version, which is kind of cool. I, I wanted to mention sadhu is male, but if you're a female, female sadhu, uh, you're a sadvi, which is really really nice. Um, and it's uh, a, a sadhu is a religious ascetic um, or a holy holy person in Hinduism. But it's also known in Buddhism, Jainism. Uh, they are essentially people who renounce the worldly life, and they're sometimes alternatively referred to as a yogi. So that's where maybe the confusion I had that is that is indeed true. Um, and then sometimes um, 
yeah, it's uh, pronounced all, di all differently. So, sorry, Mike, you had your hand up. Do you want to jump in? No, I just thought um, before we start all this, I thought sage was a type of herb, but then I was correct. Yes. Correct yes, exactly. To non-native speakers of English, you would yeah. be um, forgiven if you thought sage was uh, sage was an, an herb as well, because it is, it is. That's uh, in the context of what we're talking about today, sage is a distinguished um, person of wisdom. Um, so yeah, some, some cool kind of ideas there. Um, and to kind of delve into it a little bit further, if I can, like um, if, again, you're wondering what a, a, a set, um, somebody who's uh, a religious ascetic, it comes from a Greek word, a romanticized uh, Greek word for, for exercise, actually training. It's a lifestyle characterized by abstinence from sensual pleasures and often for the purpose of pursuing spiritual goals. So I just love the depth of, of understanding just in these simple words that you may or may not have been exposed to um, <clears throat> in the Western world, reading this book for the first time, which many people do indeed do. Um, so that's that's a sadhu. So you can kind of picture this sadhu comes in to see Yogananda's mother. Uh, and that would have been a striking appearance, even, even if it is a little bit more common to have sadhus roaming the land in India. Um, but um, really, uh, Mike, there's a, a little bit just before we move on here, if you would kindly read on on sadhu um if you have that ready yeah sadhu means one who practices a sadhana or keenly follows a path of spiritual discipline although the vast majority of sadhus are yogis not all yogis are sadhus a sadhu's life is solely dedicated to achieving moksha liberation from the cycle of death and rebirth the fourth and final ashrama stage of life through meditation and contemplation of Brahman. Sadhus often wear simple clothing, such as saffron colored clothing in Hinduism and white or nothing in Jainism, symbolizing their sannyasa, renunciation of worldly possessions. Very nice. And it's like last time we just, not last time, a few episodes ago, we distinguished between, was it yogi and um, Swami. Swami, right? And now we're doing yogi and sadhu. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Our vo vocabulary yes, is growing. Yes. Mm. It is. It is. Sage, sadhu, yogi, um, Swami. You know, it's, it's, it is amazing. Um uh, how much you, you can learn if you really go into the details we are doing, which not many people do, to be fair. Uh, but it's it's uh, a beautiful picture that that paints, doesn't it? This saffron colored clothing uh, individual coming in to give some prophecies, as it turns out, to Yogananda's mother. Um, and certainly uh, it sets the tone exactly for what we're about to go into. And um, the, the, uh, his mother did say that the simple words that he insists that he is there to see the mother of Mukunda struck a profound chord within her. Um, Mike, do you want to jump in? I, yeah, I, I feel that's because when she had Mukunda and went to Lahiri Mahasha, he gave her that prophecy about him, right? That your son will be a yogi that your son will be a spiritual engine. I think we talked about it at length in the last episode. And now she feels a special responsibility, right? She feels like I have this person who is so important to the world. I'm, I'm his mother. And when she hears that something is needed from her in that respect, she, she um, uh, feels that this is very important. Um, and mm -hmm. that's why I feel like it struck a chord for her. And that's mm -hmm. kind of, maybe it's also something she she has been waiting for to to do those kind of things. No, if my mother, regardless of if anybody told me that I was you know told her that I was going to be a prophet or you know whatever, if somebody <laughs> had to come and said I I'm here to see the mother of Chris, that she would probably feel pretty. <laughs> 
like you know what's wrong we know what has he done like uh kind of <laughs> more negative negative and positive right um mm. any mother that is is summoned that in some way or somebody insists to see them um I, I, and it's by the by the link that you know it's about their son. It probably does strike you know fear, maybe fear in the heart of somebody. But she she doesn't describe it as that obviously, but she described it as a profound chord. And my my musings on it really is that you know this concept of time is such that it's maybe linear to our minds, but maybe in reality it isn't such. Um, and this profound chord is something that maybe she expected, something similar to what you were saying, Mike. I, I think you're right. And also, she is um, a person, we will also see that later, someone very in tune with God's will and cares about that. She has like a, a, a very spiritual understanding of life and, and her role in this. And so it also, I think it also comes from, from there. So here we have this great sadhu, great colorful character you know if you saw that uh, a sadhu walking down the street in, in london or something you know it would it would, it would certainly certainly stand out wouldn't he but here he is um coming to yogananda's mother with a message and she immediately goes uh, and bows at his feet and that she uh, she sensed that uh, the man in front of her was a true man of god now bowing at one's feet is a practice that is more common for saints, saintly figures, uh, certainly in India, but it it is not common elsewhere, let's say in the Western world, right? So this is something that maybe is almost like a like a muscle memory, I'm sure to to some who are devotees of of some some saints and things like this, and Yogananda himself is you know done this and it's so it's a common practice, right? Um, but Mike, do you want to jump in on this? Yeah, two things. First of all, yes, you're right. So I think it's it's very customary in India if if you if you address a swami, you first bow down to them, touch their feet, and it's um, when Westerners come to wise as ashrams, for example, that's like mm -hmm. I don't think you do it usually, but you see all all the other people doing it. So and and um, I feel like when when Indians come to the West. I, I feel like some, some of them have the inclination of uh, of bowing down because it's it's like you said it's very customary. One thing that struck me here was that she she sensed that in front of her was a true man of God. That that mm -hmm. like means that she had like some some real intuition, some really mm -hmm. um, she was really guided by by God because that is something that. A normal person would not be able to do right like not, if a strange sadhu knocks on your door you would be like get, get lost <laughs> or yeah. maybe you, you'd be nice to him but you wouldn't know just by seeing him like there's so many stories right where where sadhus appear especially in, in in indian mythology and and people don't know that they are that they are perfectly realized and um and she just does it without any um strain I feel like there is also some relatability in it though because I don't know about you but uh, when you're in the presence of someone who has divine qualities you feel it and maybe it's it's again maybe it's one of those things where instantaneously she just knew and mm. maybe we would if we were in the presence of a great one you would know like imagine if Guruji was there and you'd never met him before you would know <laughs> you I mean <laughs> most likely that he was you know divine um so maybe maybe there's something in there that's for all of us you know <laughs> what do you think Chris you would hope you would hope you would know <laughs> mm, you would hope. <laughs> in some sense and I think honestly I think it's more mechanical in a sense where this is somebody who lived a life of yoga, mm. who who didn't just go to practice on a Tuesday, and then kind of went back to like a worldly life of sensory, you know, sensory, you know, um, 
indulgence, right? She really lived that life. She was initiated into Korea. We know she was very spiritually advanced. And I think the more we do that work, everything else takes care of itself. You know, I'd say I, I would hope and jest, right? Because um, essentially, if, you, if you've done the work, it's a capability that is innate within all of us is how I see it, essentially, if, if you're doing this work. Guruji talks about this, you know, he is in the presence of many saintly people. And he, you know, says that he senses, senses their great devotion and, and senses that they're really truly a person of, of God. Um, even there's a great story that we'll get into in a later, later chapter where he goes into the bedroom of a saintly woman uh, and before he goes in, and she she's there, it's the lady who manifests Christ, um, the sacrifice, um, um, and Terry is Neumann. The blood's, yeah. Terry yeah. is Neumann. Thank you. Thank you very much. And he actually, I think in that story, he prepares himself, attunes himself, kind of gear, gears in, you know, into this meditative state of sorts before he kind of enters. Then he's able to uh, tune in with the vision, with the the sights that she sees, things like this. So, I think we, you know, we can prepare ourselves for that. But if you're living that every single day, you're going to be more prepared to be able to recognize saintliness in in, in others. And it it might be that the sadhu also wanted to be recognized as a messenger of God in some way. Mm -hmm. But we have seen some like earlier in the in the previous chapter, we saw that. Lahiri Mahashaya performed this miracle of not appearing on the photograph, basically to um, the effect that the person trying to photograph him realizing his, his divine nature, right? But otherwise he wouldn't mm -hmm. have. Otherwise he would have just said, oh yeah, there's this guy. I'll just take a picture of him without him without even asking him. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so sometimes people need miracles to actually accept that someone is um a saint and she had just this understanding like oh yeah he's at the door okay i feel like and maybe it's also because um he asked her about mukunda maybe maybe that also was uh, was something that she was kind of felt oh yeah this is god talking to me now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so she maybe had that anticipation she maybe had that mm -hmm. intuitive awareness and that knowledge that knowing sense of knowing but i i uh, I, I love there's two so there's two things there's two prophecies essentially that the sadhu gives to her and the first one he addresses her i, I love this he address addresses her as mother now i i made a note to myself like is this common because i you know i'm not i don't live in india and i'm not completely familiar with the culture there it may be familiar to show respect, um, especially if it's he's trying to deliver a message, a divine message. So maybe there's something more akin there. But I don't know, Mike. Do you have anything for us on this, or no? It could it could be that it's customary. I wouldn't know. Um, I will also we wonder need, what we need Priyank. Of, we need Priyank in this. I also wonder <laughs> what kind of word to use in Hindi if he said ma or something like that, mm. and if that's and if that's towards her actually being a mother or or is it just or is it her being a woman i'm i'm not sure um mm -hmm. and we have to remember that also lahir mahasha i called her little mother right so maybe maybe it is something that is customary yeah i get divine ma divine mother so that yeah that's where my mind went uh, went with it uh, as well, it'd be keen, keen to hear if the listeners have anything to say on that. So the message, the first prophecy essentially is, um, unfortunately, or rather not unfortunately, we use these words so frivolously, really. Um, but the reality is that she wasn't going to uh, live past her next illness. So that the stay on earth shall not be long, are his words. And her reaction is super interesting, that she felt uh, there was silence and as it goes on it looks like the sadhu purposefully left that silence he didn't rush into the next thing that you tried to say even though it's a monumentous prophecy again that he was to make um 
So there's a real significance to this, that they both sat in the silence together. And she said she felt no alarm, only a vibration of great peace. Such a beautiful moment. No, so, so, so beautiful. And we can break this down in many, many different, different ways. Um, before we do, Mike, jump in. That's a super significant sentence. When I when I read that, like if somebody comes up to me and says, oh, by the way, you can die soon. I would not take it that well, I think. I would be um, devastated, I guess. And then um, she is not. She is, um, it even brings a vibration of peace to her. Like maybe she knew all along or maybe she is just so in tune with God's will that she feels I was, I come on this earth. So she's super aware what she is, that she is um, uh, in this human form, but she's a soul and she incarnated and she has a few roles, a few things to do, a few tasks. And when those tasks are over, then she's done here. So she doesn't have a strong attachment to her life because just just to live it, she just has a, a list of things to do, I guess. Yeah, I think that's it's a really great take on it. That's um, that's something that I thought myself is it's a confirmation that she's doing the right thing in a sense with her life you know like this peacefulness that's you know when whenever i <laughs> i think about like getting too excited or getting too animated or something it's you're probably going away from the peace that is that you get when you commune with god in some sense so so there's excitement is probably a bit overstated in everyday life and really peace is probably where the fun's at where the, where the joy joys at in some sense like that inner silence that inner peace that communion with god and she feels that here and that it's such a beautiful moment where she gets this potentially devastating news that um she has faith i suppose because she's not told as we know what's going to come in this next part you know she's still got a really big part to play in yogananda's life and de delivering delivering something to him um, I don't know why I'm thinking I'm going to give a spoiler when, you know, everybody knows that, you know, delivering an amulet is all the title of the, <laughs> the chapter. Um, so she's good, still got this great part to play, but she doesn't know this yet. So, you know, this is it. This is before she was told that she, she'll still have a big part to play. Um, but sorry, I'll, I'll pause there. Lauren, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight again about the peace thing because I feel like that's a really important indicator of where she's going to go next. Um, you know, they say that peace is the first or one of the first indicators, if you will, of God's presence. So imagine mm -hmm. you're told that your body is going to leave this earth and you feel a great wave of peace. It's probably mm -hmm. that moment where you realize oh, I'm going home, you know? Mm -hmm. So for her then it was probably it may have been even like a confirmation of ah okay liberation the the, the way I've been journeying mm -hmm. through this life is actually coming to to its uh unity I'll say I don't know if that is the right word um but yeah so it must have been a really affirming moment for her to have felt that way in the last episode, I shared a little bit of an insight into some personal personal story. And I, I can kind of expand on that. So last episode, I was talking about my wife and, um, and how I was I was praying to meet somebody. And uh, ultimately, you know, I did and, and um, now, we're, now we're married. But when I proposed, I felt this vibration of peace. I felt a vibration of peace, sorry, I should say. And... It's funny, I was talking to my, my best, one of my best mates and his wife. And my wife was asking her, like, oh, so how did you feel when, you know, when you, you were proposed to? And she said the same thing spontaneously. She said, yeah, like I felt just pure peace. And I thought, oh, that's a lovely coincidence, isn't it? Like this, this feeling of peace that we both, both couples kind of felt in that moment where you're coming, you're committing to a divine, it's a divine, you know, partnership or relationship to 
commit to each other and then you get this sense of sense of peace i think you know that is something to share you know if you're lucky to have these little moments throughout your life that was that was one that i was lucky enough um to have but obviously much different circumstances to what you're going to have his mother's receive you know <laughs> experiencing that so um certainly kudos and and speaks volumes to to her level of advancement um <laughs> tip of the hat right <laughs> 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 but I think it's a lovely add into the book because these yeah. things, you know, there's so many things Jürgen is probably filtering, right? And he's including this mm -hmm. for us to to take learnings from them. Um, but yeah, kudos, kudos to the mother. She's she's got it. She's got it done. Um, so so just before this, actually, um, you know, the sadhu says the great masters wish you to know, and the great masters wish you to know. Who are the great masters? Who she, who could she, who could she be referring to? Not the obvious answer to my mind is well the uh, sort of the gurus, you know, the Hirdi Mahasaya, her her guru, right? Um, now, you know, he's maybe waiting there. You know, we we are told that our guru is um, it's a it's multiple lifetimes of a relationship. It's beyond this physical life. Our guru is there to take care of us. And Priyank actually said that. Um, for for most people who don't have a guru going into real heavy preparations for when you do pass is even more important to those who don't have a guru because they're the gurus are going to be there working with you to make sure that that transition from death into the say after after death um, is is smooth is is um is easy so uh we're we're blessed to have that relationship and these great masters that we have, you know, the SRF masters, maybe they're all, all, all there for kind of, hopefully, <laughs> I hope, to, you know, watching out, watching out, out over all of us, all of the devotees. Um, Mike, what's your take on it? So first, I think her guru would be Lahir Mahashaya. So, um, but then also, we said that before that Guruji is a bit humble with who his parents really are, especially his mother, because from the glimpses that we get from her, she's probably this really great saint. And mm -hmm. she, she might have been, the way I imagine it, like Lahiri Mahashaya and Babaji, they were like sitting in a circle there, plotting this whole thing. And she was also probably one of the people sitting there and saying, I'll, I'll play the role of the mom. Like, yeah. okay, me, me, me. <laughs> <laughs> That's my hot take here. <laughs> nice. I like it. I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. Um, so we we have a footnote. I'm trying to say, check, where is the footnote? But I think I'm pretty sure the footnote here. Yeah. Um, so it's just after your next illness should prove to be your last, number four, footnote four. And this is really um, uh, Yogananda's realization that the mother's, you know, uh, his, uh, that the mother hastened plans for Ananta's wedding because of what's about to come, you know, what we're about to learn in this next prophecy. So the next illness shall prove to be your last. Okay. So she's now thinking, well, you know, my, my eldest son is, is due to get married before I leave this earth. I want to see that, you know, that's something she's pushing for. So yoga Ananta there in a, in a really lovely footnote, um, reflecting on, on the reality of this. And he didn't know obviously until later, after she did pass, sometime after she did pass, um, that uh, that this was the case, and this would have been one of the motivations that um, she was really pushing. She was really heavily involved, as she would have been anyway, um, but even more so. Yeah, sorry, Mike. And and as we as we read before, she would choose the bride for him. She, as we also know, wouldn't make it for the wedding. But he eventually marries that girl, right? That same girl. So she she kind of, I guess it's the last thing on her list that she still needs to do. And she can't, she ticked it off. Yeah. Yeah, I think part of me thought to myself, well, if she's really stricken with desire, it's probably not an amazing thing. You know, if you, you have these worldly desires, you probably, you probably don't want them. But I'm sure the great masters were helping her you know, um, or maybe she was able to to witness because we do know in stories of Mejda that they actually did talk after death, uh, the mother with uh, with 
Kuriji, which was mm -hmm. super, super fascinating, not included in the autobiography of a yogi. Too, uh, too, too scary, too scary for yeah. most readers. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh yeah that's a whole other story so th this second prophecy then um what is it we well um the continuation here is that you know finally he addressed me again so we have this long pause we don't know how long but we, we have this pause where the first bit of information that it gives her is your silence this uh, vibration of peace is there um, maybe the Sadhu also had a part to play in delivering that news to her. He was a true man of God after all. So um, maybe that vibration of peace that emanates from him really helped influence that as well. Um, so he goes on to say that uh, she's going to be this custodian of the of a silver amulet, amulet, amulet uh, and that he wasn't going to give her give it to her then. Um, it would manifest, materialize in her hands the next day as she meditated um and he, he he actually gives her strict instructions here that it's actually on her deathbed that it's the eldest son and nanta that she would have to instruct to then uh, give to yogananda um the second second son so um and it would be for a whole year afterwards so he really does give her these instructions and as we know the instructions were followed through almost precisely and that they kind of slipped a little bit but we can forgive him for that um before i go on mike do you want to jump in two things so one it might have been also some confirmation for who this person really is to her that he knew so much about her family without ever having met them right he said he came in and said um, mm -hmm. about Mukunda, um, which is the name of her son. And then he later talks about Ananta, her oldest son, without probably ever having met any of them. <laughs> but he, but he knew, he knew exactly who they, um, her her relationship to them, and when to do what. It's a really good observation. I didn't even think about that, but it would have been quite weird if, you know. Yeah. He, do, <laughs> um, he does come in with the credentials of knowing, certainly. Um, uh, so yeah, really good observation there, Mike. Um, so so I thought to myself, okay, well, you know, we, we talked about this maybe um, a little bit in the last episode, but you know, why her? It's a, it's a great honor, isn't it, to be a custodian of, of, the, of, the, of the amulet? And I thought, well, could he not have maybe given the message to Ananta, after all, you know, could he given it, given it to Bhagavati, his father, who Yogananda had a good relationship with also. Why her? Mike, give us the answer. <laughs> I, 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 will, I will make some comment on this. So, so I feel like Ananta played this role because it helped him in his own development. That's what I'm gonna say. And then he didn't actually say, did he actually say one year or did he say when um, Mukunda is ready to um, abandon all worldly desires? Because he, he, he said both. Okay. Yeah. So maybe, maybe the 14 months were yeah. actually um, because of the latter. I'm not sure. Um, but that, mm -hmm. that could be one explanation why it happened later. But the but the mother, I was saying why why the mother? So for mm -hmm. me, I'll say for, for why I think the mother. Yogananda's relationship with his mother was pure. Mm -hmm. And it was this pure love that he had with with his mother and she for him. And I think that bond that we know after her death really shook him to his core. And he was crying out to the heavens, you know, demanding an answer as to why God took his mother from him. That really, that really drove him immensely, didn't it? So there's that really strong connection there. And I think that in its essence, it's probably why her. What do you think, guys, Mike? I think you're Mike. right. I, I actually didn't think of that in that way. But he, he does mention later that he his her her deep brown eyes kind of were solacing for him in so many so many times in his childhood right and 
And then the only thing that could replace that later on was um, the love for divine mother, right? So she, you're right, Chris. She did, she did play this role and they had this really strong connection. And she was maybe before he had developed this love for God, he, he, she was kind of maybe like a kind of relay point for that. And, and probably she was the strongest spiritual influence he had in his childhood. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And I think, in, I have this feeling that his bond was with his mother, because it was so strong, she was the person that had to leave her body first on this earth for him. Because if she didn't leave her body, then he perhaps would not have had that strong relationship with Divine Mother. Um, it was really enhanced, wasn't it, by his mother's death. And then to hear this prophecy coming from the lips of his birth mother, I don't know, perhaps it was more, it was, again, that divine sign, you know, for him that uh, was, was really, like, hitting to his heart. Because if it had come from his brother or his father, perhaps it wouldn't have quite hit home as much mm. i don't know but it is uh, yeah. it's an interesting one to ponder on i feel mike chip in and i'm not sure if that's a reason but maybe it also makes him more relatable and in, in times that we are in where oftentimes people grow up and if he would have grown up with those perfect pa parents perfect family situation maybe Maybe it made him more relatable that he had to go through this in his in his childhood and that he felt this pain. Um, mm. It's just just a thought. Mm. So before we continue, let what is an amulet? What are we even talking about? We're all assuming not in our heads. Yeah. Yes, we know. What I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure most of us asked that question when we read the book. What was is it, an amulet? Like, <laughs> what is an amulet? And for for those for those people. Especially, you know, we're talking we're talking about um, a divine amulet. Essentially, um, in this sense, we're talking about uh, something that can be worn, um, you know, as a as a, as a, over over the neck, um, or I believe over the wrist as well. But you can you can wear it there, um, and really, uh, the the amulet itself, uh, as also described here, as a talisman. Uh, that shall materialize um, is really there to act as a protection and it's something that is to protect you um, from wrongdoing from evil from uh, anything any any bad that might be able to happen to you and it's uh, given by a blessing by god or by uh, one of god's messengers so that is essentially what what we're talking about here um when uh, when they're saying that they'll receive a certain amulet sorry mike when when i think of amulets it's uh, when i was little i read the book the never ending story and that's kind of what i always think of there's he has this amulet called the orin and it, it fulfills all his wishes um and that, that's kind of what i was thinking about it's something you you wear around your neck and it's like a lucky charm kind of thing that's that's the picture that I always get when I think of amulet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly a charm against evil or injury, as defined online. I think Wikipedia gave me that one. Um, so it's any object. A talisman is any object ascribed with religious or magical powers, intended to protect, heal, or harm individuals for whom they are made. So it can act as a good or bad thing, uh, depending on how it's made, how it's put together. I'm sure that is some. Um, real uh kind of a cult uh magic going on there at, at times um uh as well but okay so we do uh know then that um the amulet is being um going to be given to the to the mother um he, he actually says he goes on to say here uh that mckinda will understand the meaning of the talisman from from the great ones so i think a question in my mind was is, the is it saying that the talisman's from the great ones or is it saying that the message, the, the meaning of the talisman will be given to him by the great ones? 
I guess the former to my mind or both <laughs> essentially yeah. both. you know what do you think Lauren I think both I mean it's all one isn't it really it comes from but it is also gifted as so yeah for me <laughs> I feel both um so we're, but we're talking and, and, yeah in any sense Makunda would have known exactly what I, um exactly yeah as he does as he does you know yeah. quite uh readily go on to tell us uh, in a, a couple of paragraphs time that he, he knows he knows um uh more about it than what he's even willing to share which is frustrating for any kind of um <laughs> nut like me that wants to know everything about it <laughs> um so really you know we we talked about it there well just to kind of cap this off uh that uh he uh should be he should receive the amulet when he's ready to renounce all worldly hopes and to start his vital search for God. That's a really significant uh, part in, in this in this story. And maybe speaks to a couple of different things. Um, one, what we were just saying about the mother passing is significant to Yogananda. Um, and maybe a year later, Yogananda was maybe ready to receive this ready to kind of heal and move on to some greater extent than what it was in that short time before. Um, and if the mother's death is Lauren, you said that she maybe had to die first, that that was mm. his greatest tie to earth it was his love for his mother, this material kind of this love for, you know, human, human based love, isn't it? Um, which we know is, is more of a lesser love. Um, than the divine love for uh, with God, um, but that was his tie. So maybe that tie had to go in some way. Um, maybe my so, yeah, my my interpretation of it. Um, so very very important um, idea here that is the vital search for God is ready to start in young Mukunda when he receives the amulet. Um, and he says, you know, he'll have it for some years, and when it's served its purpose, it shall vanish. Um, and uh, yeah, no matter what you do, where you keep it, it's going to vanish um, to whence it came. We we could probably talk about a half an hour about the material materializing and how these things actually work. I mean, that's a whole subject for a lifetime of study, maybe. Um, uh, but you know, we, we'll we'll just I think draw a line under that to say that all things are possible in it for with with god really to be able to manifest in this plane manifest um various forms uh through atoms and the, the mastery over them um extremely extremely interesting stuff there um probably for me actually just now that i'm thinking about this when i first read the autobiography of a yogi this made this planted the seed of fascination within me mm -hmm. to a great extent um that i thought that the intuitive knowing within me said yes this is true and that hey there's so much more to life like this is great you know this is a great life you know it should be really interested and fascinated and it really led me you know one of those uh many things that led me down the path of, of yoga um was the fascination and love for life and and you know these these magical things that happen um are, are, you know they're they're incredible and they're to be appreciated for the uh the the, the wonder that, that we're all sharing in that, that is life so it, it was a really significant moment actually for me to, to when i when i read this um so the next um paragraph moving on is that um yogananda's mother proffered as it says here alms to the saint so she again bowed before him and I thought kind of funny that Sadi didn't accept the offering, but he did depart with a blessing. Yeah. Now, to go back to this, this is why I kind of wanted to really de defy what Sadi is. It's, you know, somebody who really renounces all sense, you know, sensory um, activity and, and uh, they tend to uh, live off the charity of others, food, money, whatever it might be. So this is alms, essentially. This is what they mean by alms here. Like, it could be pretty much anything that might be of use to, to the saint, to the sadhu. Um, but he doesn't accept it. 
and I thought they're kind of funny. He's no, I'm not. I'm not here for for your alms. I'm not here for your money for your food. I'm here to deliver a message, and I'm going to leave. <laughs> and he comes and goes quite quickly. But Mike, yeah, I wonder about his. How should I put this? How his his life on Earth? If if he was even a permanent member of this planet, mm. or if he maybe mm. just was someone who materialized mm. to play this role, Guruji describes him as the strange sadhu, right? Or it, he's he's described as that in the or, or the servant does. Uh, okay, but Guruji echoes that as well. So he might he might have been someone who is has absolutely no use for any worldly things, or he might return to his cave in the Himalayas where the alms wouldn't help him either. And <laughs> might not be someone who, who needs food or anything like that. So, but he, he, when he says he did leave with a blessing kind of means he did appreciate the alms, but he was just mm. not in need of them. Yeah, and the topic of blessings is interesting. <clears throat> and I thought, it's it's something that is so um in Christianity, you know, saints, the the monks, the priests, you know, the people give blessings, you know, they tend to hold their hold their hands up and say a prayer. They, you know, they might put their hands together, say a prayer, they might try to bless you that way. So it's quite quite a common concept, I think, in Western the Western world. But it's something you could easily roll over and kind of not realize the significance of it but it really is defined as a favor of a gift or a gift bestowed by god uh, so that's the kind of strict definition thereby bringing happiness or invoking of god's favor upon a person um and in that sense everything's really a blessing that really comes from god everything kind of directly comes from god life is a blessing um we we do have a recording that we can play there's so, there's so much out there um, but what I thought was, okay, a blessing, this is quite a physical presence. You've got Sadhu there. Maybe we don't know the description, but maybe he's departing with a blessing. He's maybe raising his hands. He's maybe, you know, putting his hands on the, on the head or he's doing something where he's physically there. Um, but as we don't have his, our guru in a physical form, you know, with us, we have um, this concept actually that i wanted to bring today which is that we still have our guru's blessing even though it's not in a physical form we don't need somebody you know a physical individual to hold hands up to actually give us that blessing we, we receive it as priyanks talked about um, with babaji even reciting the name in a chant of babaji 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 we're receiving blessings just just um by having the presence of babaji in our minds so um mike you, you're able to um, play a recording now just as a heads up to people this is a recording found on on the uh website on the official website um that you can find um there it's a clip of um attuning our lives through guruji's blessings sri Dayamata, sharing a personal experience uh, as a witness of a, an event um, with yogananda um and we can play it's a couple of minutes so uh do check it out online if you want to hear more about this. Um, go on to the bookstore with the yogananda.srf.org site. But Mike's going to play the little clip for us. Yes, I will do. We are each one of us so blessed. I think of it as the years roll by and as I get older in this work, I realize more than ever the greatness of Master. And then I am brought again back to his words one day when he was walking out to his porch to exercise and I was following him. And he turned around quietly and shook his finger like this and said so sweetly, not with any egotism, Master was devoid of egotism. When I am gone, the world will know what I am. And when he said it, my mind was conscious of the word am and I thought to myself, he said that in that way for a reason. I don't understand what he meant now, but someday we will understand. When I am gone, the world will know what I am. He could have said the world will know what I was. It was correct grammar. The world will know what I am. And how many times 
I think that message of his and think, indeed, Master, the more I grow on this path, the more I strive to find God on this path, the more I realize what you are. You are not an ordinary being, but you are indeed the truest and the purest reflection of that divine which it has been my privilege and which it will be the privilege of this present age to behold. Indeed, it makes me feel most unworthy to strive to follow in the footsteps of that blessed Guru. But I can only say one thing to you, as I have said again and again in India to the devotees. Only one thing that is real to me in this life, instilled in my heart and consciousness by that divine Guru. Love, love, love. Divine love, divine love. Well, it's awesome. Actually makes me very emotional to listen to that. <laughs> Brings tears to my eyes. So, so, so powerful. Um, so blessings, topic of blessings again. How long do we have? We could talk about this all day, I think, but really we're receiving them all the time from our guru, from not just in this physical form, but uh, he's there with us when we think of him near. Mike? Yeah, don't want to know where I would be if it wasn't for his blessing. And mm -hmm. Dayama just has this way of expressing her love and appreciation for the guru. Like, I, I feel no, no one else can. Like, it's like you said, Chris, it's just that the vibe, the, the mood in the room just changed in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Grounded in a, in a heartfelt <laughs> center. Yeah. <clears throat> so good. So good. So I hope you enjoyed that. So, so we have, um, sorry, Lauren, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say that I definitely feel that you're right, Chris. You know, like blessings are everywhere. And I feel like it's really important for us to remember that even the difficult things are blessings too. It's easy to feel mm. blessed when things are going really, really well for you. And, you know, you're feeling peaceful and, and loved or Hashtag whatever. Blessed. Yeah, do you know, but actually the diff everything in life is a blessing from God and gurus, you know. So we're very, very blessed indeed, aren't we, really? Mm. I'll remind you of that next time you stub your toe, Lauren. <laughs> Do you know, when, when the physical thing happens, I'm like, oh, karma. <laughs> All right. Same yeah. Way. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. That one's played out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I actually yeah. did. I hurt myself this time last week and I've, I've been out of action really? for a week <clears throat> with some of the sports that I play. Um, and I thought, oh, it's karma for something. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah just, say wow. thank, just say thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, move on. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, good. Good. Uh, sorry, Mike. Go on. Yeah, that's the, that's the famous prayer by Sister Gianna Mata, right? Like, don't change any circumstance in my life. Mm. Change me. Mm. And that's what you guys just expressed. So, wow. that's a really good way to see the world. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. be a lot less hurt in the world when you're um so the next evening she was sitting there and this she's folded folded hands meditation and yes it materialized so she had a, any doubt which i don't think she had yeah it would have been gone by this point how, mm -hmm. <laughs> how would i have reacted if something had mater materialized it's something you maybe it was made uh, popular in star trek you know, the materializing of the food in the canteen, you know, that's the materializing humans back and forth from locations. Maybe that is our future. You and know, then the best, the do. best part, the dematerialization of the dirty dishes. That's perfect. The dirty <laughs> <laughs> You see, I don't mind the dirty dishes. I don't mind them. I it's a it's a yoga practice. You're cleaning the karma. You're you're just you're scrubbing that karma off with every stroke. I, I agree. I, I quite like doing the dishes too, but I feel like when I start doing them, my guests always feel like I want them to leave. It's like it's like my my yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mean, Meanwhile, meanwhile, you're just in your happy place. Like yeah. Um, same here. I Barbara, oh right, she cooks. I clean. 
So thank goodness yes. I, I enjoy the uh, <laughs> cleaning because, uh, yeah, I do it every day. Um, all righty. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I mean, she's obviously deeply spiritually advanced and isn't isn't phased at all by this materializing of a silver amulet um and uh it made it, it's the, it's a great description here it made itself known by a cold smooth touch she jelly uh, jealously guarded it for more than two years so we have a timeline and hence this is where we have a correction to make last episode oh. for those paying attention and <laughs> I love how this is a surprise for, 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 for us. It's just hit me um, now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Last episode, we were musing and saying, okay, well, I, you know, um, why did they wait that long uh, between, you know, getting the amulet and giving it to Yogananda? Why, you know, it's risky. No, it was me, actually. It said it was risky, you know, um, having waited until the deathbed, you know, on the deathbed to, to give it. And... I said it in my excitement in that moment, forgetting that we actually have this great, you know, piece of information is exactly why this happened is, is that she was instructed to do so. She was instructed to wait till the deathbed. She was instructed to give it to the eldest brother. Uh, and she was instructed to tell him to wait for a year. So we have all the answers here. We were musing last, last episode for nothing, <laughs> it seems. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the correction for any any listeners out there. I wonder because we record these ahead of time, will any listeners actually flag flag that to say, hey, you know, mm. not the Chris, this is actually discussed in there so that you're going to lead the next <laughs> in the next part of the, the book. Anyway, Lauren. I've also just realized that this means that she knew for two years that she was going to die in her next or she was gonna leave her body i should say um in her next illness that's a long time like two years mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. wow yeah i'm sure it wasn't like a common cold you know no um <laughs> she's sne she's sneezing like is this the time um <laughs> no it's you know it's a serious illness right but it, it hit her pretty pretty quickly and knowing now this story she had manifested herself in a vision to Yogananda. You know, this she tried to get Yogananda to come see her. You know, this is all mm -hmm. she was pushing for this wedding because, you know, she was concerned like I might not have a lot of time if my it's they say here that it's it's going to be a short amount of time. Um mm -hmm. so you know it's all it's all comes together, doesn't it, in this in this uh, these few paragraphs. Um so that's the correction. Maybe the eagle-eyed or you know the keen listeners have already corrected us, and we're all we're recording this ahead of time, so we, we can go back and look to see. We're yelling at the screen. Up. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, like no. Shaking the shaking the laptop. You're wrong. Guys. <laughs> so um, so here she is. She's not surprised that the the amulet manifests itself, materializes there. Uh, she she guards it for two years, and I thought to myself, "Gosh, where would she have kept this amulet, amulet for two years with a bunch of kids running around, you know, opening things and curious, like looking in every wardrobe and door? Like, I wonder where she kept it for two years." <laughs> but there, she she does she does a very good job. Obviously, she, no, nobody we don't have any record of anybody discovering this amulet. Uh, Lauren. I also find it really interesting how she says, I have jealously guarded it for more than two years. Mm. It's a real indicator of like some little humanness that's remaining perhaps within her or something else. I wonder what our listeners feel about that too. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of, it makes me, I don't know, it makes me smile a little bit. It feels kind of like a light hearted jealousy rather than something more severe um but yeah it was quite interesting what do you feel mike yeah, i was just gonna bring up jealous the word jealous as well mm. and it has a bit of a negative connotation i feel mm -hmm. like but maybe in this sense it doesn't it's like a maybe a fierceness of how she was guarding it right like really trying to fulfill her spiritual mission that she that she has maybe that it's meant in that way 
And like you said, listeners, if you have any ideas on this, please share it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my I, did, I didn't actually, it didn't even occur to me that it, there was a negative connotation to it, um, which is curious because I think the interpretation to my mind is uh, is one of fervor. She, mm. she guarded it, you know, with real, mm. um, uh, you know, a real strong kind of passion. And uh, she clearly had this amazing experience, right? You know, it's something that was so significant. <laughs> but again, imagine if something materialized <laughs> in your hands. Um, it's incredible. You know, it's if she ever needed a confirmation or if she ever had any doubt, it's gone. You know, this is, you know, her mission was to, to do this. So she would have been steadfast, you know, I'm sure mm -hmm. beyond any doubt that she was to keep this promise, uh, I suppose that she would have maybe invisibly made. Um, she follows up here, probably again, Priyank's mentioned a couple of times about the romanticism that we see in the words that we that we uh, have in, in the autobiography of a yogi. And for me, it really kind of moved, it really moved me to read the next part where she said, um, this is a message that she gave through Ananta to Yogananda. And of course, Ananta would have benefited from this as well. He was the eldest son, right? But she said, do not grieve for me as I, as I shall have been ushered by my great guru into the arms of the infinite. Farewell, my child. The cosmic mother will protect you. That's a, it really moves me, that statement. Huh? Um, the divine love, commitment, the faith, the, the joy. You know, she's on her, she's on her deathbed, right? She, this isn't a happy moment for her, for her anyway is it? it's obviously something that she's suffering her body's suffering at very least but she's there with god still on her deathbed really really beautiful moment um for me but mike do you want to comment and if we we haven't picked up on it yet i i would say this again those are the words of a saint right this is how <laughs> how a saint leaves the earth and I said earlier that Guruji is very good at like calling all the people saints that are that are appear in his life, but he's very humble with his parents, with his mother. He wouldn't say mm -hmm. that there, but I guess that's how I would interpret it. That she um, incarnated as a fully realized soul and did this as a seva to Guruji, this incarnation. Mm -hmm. And Lahir Mahashaya and the other great masters are waiting for her on the other side. And she also like passes her son to the Divine Mother as well, which is so beautiful. You know, that like that is divine love, isn't it? Right there. Just saying, you know, cosmic mother will protect you. It's mm -hmm. out of my astral hands now, or whatever you want to call it. My physical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, Into that's my the word. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Mike? Mike. Yeah. Um, um I, I I had a section from Mechda that I wanted to read out. Um mm -hmm. it's it's because in the book Mechda, this whole uh section with the the letter is very similar to the autobiography. But then at the end of it, he adds another paragraph that I found telling. And I'm just going to read it out. It's very short. It says, on learning how Lahiri Mahashaya had blessed Majda and predicted his spiritual destiny, I understood why, Ma why Mother had so carefully made for him the image of the Mother Kali when we were living in Gorakhpur. She felt it her divine duty to nurture his every spiritual inclination. And I guess that's, mm -hmm. that, that was probably her main goal in this, in this uh, life as mother of Yogananda. I wonder what you guys think of, <clears throat> you're writing this book as Yogananda. You have a wealth of information to include into it. You probably could have wrote, you know, a double volume, you know, uh, at least, right, um, book. I wonder, did that, a little bit there actually made, made it in but it was drafted out you know it was made it, it made it into the draft but it was it was brought out 
Um, it seems like maybe something that, you know, when you're drafting, kind of improving slowly, 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 trying to improve the impactfulness of every paragraph, every sentence. Like um, we've got, we have this imagedta. It just occurred to me, like maybe, maybe this was in the autobiography of a yogi initially, but um, it's been draft. It was drafted or something. I don't know why it occurred to me. Possibly complete musings, but uh, thankfully we have it imagedta to to add color, even more color to the story. It's already amazingly colorful enough for us. Um, you could probably write a whole book about Yogananda's mother, about her life. Oh. It would probably be super interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Alrighty, so we have the second prophecy, and that was the second prophecy. Um, I want to move on to the Yogananda's response to this amulet. I, I barely even know where to start with this, to be honest, because you know, probably at the first three, four, three or four words is a good good place to start. But a blaze of illumination is how he start, starts this uh, paragraph. And again, it's it's something to my mind, something I envisage something. But it's easy to think, well, what you know, to not think about what actually do the other people envisage when they when they read this for the first time. And to me. The way I envisage it is illumination. This, the, you know, a, a blaze of light essentially um, came over him, uh, Yogananda, with the possession of the amulet, and dormant memories awakened. Um, now, I, whenever I think think of this, is I see Yogananda and his eyes almost glazed over because he's actually seeing more astral lights. He's seeing something different. That's how I envisage this whenever I, you know, I, I read this, um, where he's in a, in this physical form, but this blaze of illumination, this divine light uh, almost uh, reveals itself to him, hidden behind this veil of Maya that we see every day. That's sort of how I envisage it. Maybe I wondered how you guys envisaged it. Is it any different seeing? <laughs> Yeah, mine was quite different. I I um, imagined it as more of a soul intuitive illumination. Um, mm. But I suppose actually hearing yours and reflecting on how I also perceived it, perhaps we perceive this illumination as to how we, uh, our relationship is with the divine, you know, what aspects really draw draw you in perhaps. You know, we see the world as we are, don't we? Or as we think we are. Um, but yeah, I, it, it must have been, you, you can't even imagine that experience, really, can you? Uh, or perhaps you can if you've been yeah, through it. I tried to. I, try, I tried to. That's the <laughs> purpose of the exercise. Um, mm. I sp like whenever I think about it, it's almost like a daydream. I could be looking over here, but I don't actually see what I'm looking at. Because I'm okay. so wrapped in this, in this, uh, you know, my, in my mind's eye. But I, I don't, I think you're quite right, Lauren. I would say maybe in both ways, essentially, it's this intuitive knowing, this intuitive sense. Uh, Mike, what's your take? This is a, a massively spiritually charged object, this, this amulet, right? And the only thing that's it's a bit of a bummer is that it, it dematerialized so it, it was um basically created with an expiration date and then it would dematerialize because otherwise this would be something like the holy grail the ark of the covenant it would be like a, a mm -hmm. big um thing that i don't know wherever this would be you would feel the vibration of it and um it, it I would love to know more about this. There's a bit more about this in the uh, in the footnote where he says it 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 carried an inscription in Sanskrit, right? And then when you pronounce it correctly, it would um, mm. positively stimulate in a spiritual way. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would love to hold that thing in my hand for a bit and. and <laughs> uh and yeah and and as he gets it he when it says blaze of illumination 
I feel it must have been a spiritual experience. So if you would have made a movie, it would have probably been like you you get the amulet and suddenly you're not on Earth anymore. You're in this <laughs> in this other world, right? And have a, a a big spiritual experience. So that's my take. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The truth may be somewhere in between or or not at all. It would be great to to get this mm. minute detail, but that's probably greedy of me. It's not necessary. <laughs> um, but he, he does mention dormant memories awakened. Now, this this is something that he's talked about before, where maybe his brother was chastising him about a robe, and that struck a chord with him to say, "Oh, wow!" You know, um, he, he sort of alludes to you know this kind of ar aroused. Uh, I can't remember exactly how I said it, memories of a past life where he would have worn it or he was imagining, he was, you know, struck his uh, imagination that this would be something that he would be well suited to. Um, but he, he does talk about um, past lives and this is dormant memories awakened. So an extremely powerful object. Uh, he does describe it here as the talisman is round, uh, anciently quaint which i thought was quite a telling description and was covered in sanskrit characters um and that you know i i wondered was this something that one of the great gurus babaji or maybe you know we don't see them wearing amulets you know we don't see something around their necks necessarily but maybe elsewhere maybe they have amulets maybe this is like a token that they hold close to their heart, that they want to give, because Yogananda is yet with the guru. You know, he, he, he yet has that guru physically in his life. Um, and we'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but maybe it was actually some of these, you know, one of the great gurus, it was actually one of their possessions in some ways, and they they loaned it to him for a time. Like, yeah, I would I would love to dwell on the amulet for <laughs> for longer because it's just it's very mystical and I don't really know what it means. And oftentimes when I read things in the autobiography of a yogi, I feel like the content is meant for people in higher ages. And maybe this is also one of those. Maybe in, in higher ages it will become more uh, normal to just materialize things and Guruji like you, you just hinted about that there were Sanskrit characters on the amulet and that is um, a Guruji goes on and on in, in very lengthy footnotes about the importance of Sanskrit, about the power of the language, how it is the perfect language. And also I think he, that there in one part it says that in, in the Encyclopedia Americana, it says that this has been the most significant um, discovery since the invention of classical learning, right? So it, it, it is vastly important that it is in Sanskrit, the, the inscription there. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like, again, that, that it's, it's super fascinating when, when I, when I first read about the amulet I found it okay uh, that's a, that's a nice story but the more you go into it the more you feel like oh this must have had a, a really big significance and I, mm -hmm. I I wonder if that would ever be something that has a bigger significance in, in life in higher ages mm. yeah musings for days musings musings for days yeah. and Sanskrit like whatever you know I've done the Google searches and read it a couple of pages Priyank is obviously a master. He, he uh, again, I want to say, he's, he's, I can't say he speaks San Sanskrit. You're not allowed to. He, he sings. <laughs> I can't remember what he does. <laughs> What's the way, way to say it? Sorry, Priyank. We've messed up in two straight episodes, I think. Um, but he he knows Sanskrit, right? So he can he can recite it. I think that might be the better way to say it. Um, and when I was reading about this, it was saying... Sanskrit, it goes back to the Bronze Age, um, you know, four five four five hundred BC. But one of the more ancient um, first uh, reports of it is actually in the um, Bhagavad Gita, which mm -hmm. I thought was fascinating because if that's the first, <laughs> mm -hmm. the first kind of report that they have, like 
that's an established, well-formed, beautifully poetic use of that language. You know, it's not some rudimentary kind of, you know, English has gone through a couple of different versions, you know, it's evolving. It's, you know, it's there. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> It's uh, older than older than uh, you know what what maybe we know. So, um, and it so the the idea here is, that we're told is that um, Yogananda understands. He says, "I understood mm. that it came from the teachers of past lives who were invisibly guiding my steps." Now he doesn't say like my you know, the gurus of self-realization fellowship, the great masters as was described by the sadhu. Um, but he says the teachers of past lives. So you could interpret this, you know, many different ways, I suppose, but um, teachers of past lives. We know that, uh, you know, the yogis of the Himalayas have been mentioned uh, and that crops up uh, again and he yearns to be with them and, you know, the, the relationship that he has with these you know, with Babaji, it's very, very special, and uh, so on and so forth. So who exactly he's referring to doesn't doesn't quite state, but that's on purpose, right? Otherwise, it would have would have uh, given us that information. Um, and he then says a further significance. Um, <clears throat> there, there was, and I, I have to laugh every time I read this and think about this. He doesn't, he says, you know, and very poetically, he says, but one may not fully unveil the heart of an amulet. Huh. Now, that, for, very poetic for me. Um, and gosh, I wish I knew exactly what he was hinting at, but maybe we do have some hints that we can delve into here. So <clears throat> he says that the talisman uh, eventually vanished amidst some deeply unhappy circumstances in his life. Uh, the, um, the loss of the amulet uh, came at the time um, of a gain of a guru. Um, now, we're going to go into this in more detail in future episodes, so let's not uh, delve into it too much here, but um, it essentially came at the time when his guru came into his life. Um, now, the guru, as we know, acts as a, in some ways, guider, you know, protector. Uh, the guru might give blessings and so on and so forth. So if the amulet is coincidentally dematerializing after it quote unquote it served its purpose as sadhu says are we to imagine that maybe either it is guided guruji to the guru or that it's actually acting as a guru might act in some ways that help guide and protect yogananda and or from harm and so on, so on, so on, so on. You could get delve into this. My mind's just racing. But uh, Mike, what's your what's your take? Love that idea. Yeah, I, I mean, you have to think. In his life, he had his mother. Then he had one or let's say fourteen months of neither his mother, but then he had the amulet, right? And I I love to think that the amulet was like you just said, guiding him. And and maybe it it was the the kind of uh, thing that protected him of a lot of things. And like you like in one of those mystical stories, um, you know, where you have like this magical amulet and it pulls you in this direction. Go over here. Go yeah. over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that. <laughs> it's like something out of Harry Potter. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That exactly. And then and then when it vanished there was his guru right so mm -hmm. this this was bridging bridging a, a time where where he had um not not his guru yet but he but he had lost his his mother who was a spiritual guide up until then mm -hmm. and it also so he also writes after that he says that he daily traveled far on the wings of his amulet so it mm -hmm. obviously took him so far you know like you say, it was like a it was like a guide uh, in in the journey to the herald of his guru. That sign that his mm. guru was coming, and you know he didn't he didn't need that that amulet anymore because behold, the fleshly form was on its way. Yeah, it's like jumping. And I, and I wonder 
how what he meant by traveling there if this if he makes this this word work really hard here if it's maybe in his meditations or physical travel or his imagination or all of the above mm -hmm. so we, we know throughout this chapter <clears throat> he did attempt many times uh, to go to the Himalayas he was quite obsessed with the idea he wanted to join the Himalayan yogis and we talked about it maybe in the last episode that really the amulet came to him at the time when he was ready to you know uh, relinquish the worldly desires in some ways um, maybe that is I don't know is that more or less related to the Himalayas probably less but he was ready essentially to completely tune himself to God's will and that would have requ requires much sacrifice on Yogananda's part to go to America, you know, to go to the US, um, to leave the in India, you know, it, it would have required much sacrifice on his part, really. Um, and yeah, we we uh, we see here that he says um, the small boy thwarted in his attempts to reach the Himalayas, daily traveled far in the wings of his amulet. So, you know. We will go into it again in more detail. Um, but Sri Yukteswar and others were saying, look, you don't need to go to the Himalayas, you know, you can you can be here uh to to reach God and to, to do these things. So um obviously the wings of the amulet were taking him closer to God. That's my interpretation of it. Um, no matter how he was doing that, that's essentially my interpretation. Because the Himalayas, as we know, they are manifestation or representation of God essentially to my mind. So, okay, that's that's the chapter. I um, hope you enjoyed the reflections and, you know, us uh, going through uh, to your listeners and everything. Um, let's do a quick summary of um, of this chapter, and then we're going to jump into some reflections, each of us, uh, on what we liked, you know, what we discovered, um, what we might change, what we're looking forward to, these kind of things um, for the next chapter. Um, so really, you know, this, this um, chapter, we've begun by discussing the, you know, the preparations for Nanta's wedding uh, and Yogananda's mother's desire um, to, to see the eldest son get married, Paramahansa Yogananda's vision of, of his mother and the ultimate tragedy of the passing, um, Yogananda's desires and attempts to flee the Himalayas, as, as we just said, and Nanta's chastising um, and thwarting of his plans um, and the impact, of course, of, the, of his mother's death. Uh, and Ananta's admission of the delay in passing uh, to Mukunda the, the message um, of, of the mother, but ultimately uh, fulfilling that promise um, that he would have made, um, and the great story of the Hiramashai's spiritual blessing and prophecy um, by the Sadhu. Uh, sorry, Lahiramashai's prophecy and <laughs> the vision of uh, the great light from Yogananda. So we had so many stories in there. Um, what else? Um, and, and of course, yeah, in this episode, you know, we're talking about the retelling of the prophecies of the great Sadhu and the, and the amulet and, and much more, much, much more that we've talked about in the last uh, four episodes. Um, so for me, I'll, I'll, I suppose I'll start, what did I like? Gosh, everything. I don't think there's, you know, there's nothing that you don't like <laughs> in, in this. So it's a long list of things that I like. I think for me, you know, it's a clear message. Yogananda has dedicated this whole chapter to his mother, to the significance of her, the role that she's had to play. Um, for me, the takeaway is the love that he had for his mother, the, the divine love that um, they had for each other, the significance of that in an avatar's life um, and what that means for us, like what takeaways we can, we can, um, we have within our lifetime. Um, the deep dive that we've done, what I discovered really is the mystical nature of life again. Um, I think we're going to go into it about uh, in the next chapter about mani things manifesting and being mystical and so on and so forth. But this for me spurred so much fascination and imagination and, and my passion and love um, for life. Uh, it, it's it's such a beautiful, beautiful story that we've been given. Um, and then really something that I might be by change for for the next um, co coverage of the chapter. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, more user, uh, more, sorry, listener um, guidance on what they want covered would be actually really nice to start incorporating some some listeners. So if you want to, as homework, go ahead to the next chapter and, you know, start 
reading, you probably have to go a whole chapter ahead. So go to say chapter four or even five and try to read some topics and try to pull something out. Maybe that's a suggestion I, I can say if you really want to be active and ahead of the curve, we, we record a few episodes ahead than what, what we uh, release and looking forward to the next chapter. There's uh, an amazing amount of uh, stuff uh, to go through in the next chapter, of course. So, but I'll just leave it there because I know Lauren um, has a few things to say uh, as well. So I'll, I'll pass over to you, Lauren, about reflections on this uh, ah. chapter. So. <laughs> you threw that at me right there. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, there was so much in this chapter, wasn't there? And for me, it just, even from chapter one up until two, it feels like he's lived through so much. Like there's been so many lifetimes in that short period of time. And I don't know, it kind of, it, it tickles me a little bit in a, like a divine comedy kind of way, because I, you know, I often say to people, you know, in this past sort of, you know, five years or so, I feel like I've lived so many lifetimes uh, just in a short space of time. And it, like, I feel that relatability there with him, you know, it feels like, He's, he's been through lots, but and so much has happened, you know, and there's so much for us to take away from in each little paragraph, in each story that he tells. And, you know, again, it's like we're saying today, how we read it, how I read it is so different to how you read it, Chris, and how you read it, Mike, and we all take away our own little uh, reflections and lessons from it. but. Um, it, it's definitely an affirmation, I think. Oh, well, no, I know. It's definitely an affirmation for all of us that in the midst of real severe trials, it really is a blessing. And you can't discount God's hand wherever you are in life. Um, of course, it's much easier said mm. than done, but I feel like the truth still remains, you know. Um, so yeah, lot, lots to take away for me from there. I'm really looking forward to delving into more of the book. I just, oh, it's such a treat, isn't it? To be able to go through it so deeply um, and share, share it with, with you, uh, you all and listeners. And we love to read your comments and things. And so yeah, definitely have more discussions with us in the comments because it's such, it is such a joy to like read how you're perceiving the book too. Um, and on that note, Mike, what do you feel? What do you think? How's it been for you? So chapter two is like a real change of pace from mm. chapter one because it just describes a bit how his family looks like and his life and mm -hmm. gets you into everything. And then chapter two, I mean, you, you see how Guruji is very good at immersive storytelling like he get he he gets you in he makes you feel easy and then boom that's the first big thing happening um and um so where there's darkness there's also light right so his mom passes away but then he describes the beautiful moments he had with her the beautiful connection he had with her the dynamics between him and his family and and divine mother and and Lahiri Mahashaya and 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 how how she saw him as this as this um, godlike child that she wanted to raise as good as she could and um and and when you deep dive in it you so you notice that in in the life of a of a of a divine one every little detail is important there's nothing happening that's insignificant and we get to pick up on every little thing and and think about it and. I love that. So I, I find that super interesting, super fascinating. And um, yeah, I'm 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 not sure. Like I like on the things we should change for the next chapter. I would I would actually again ask the listeners what what they think. Um, I I love reading their comments, and um, this is this is really brings me joy that. On the one hand, we get to make a deep dive on this amazingly fascinating book, and on the other hand, we get feedback all the time and and um, a lot of positive ideas and a lot of um, 
very very well in, intended comments that I, I i really appreciate and i'm looking forward to the the next chapter and if you if you don't mind chris i can tease it a little bit i Go for it. so he obviously i mean we are two chapters in and we've seen saints we've seen miracles we've seen magical amulets if i may call it that and mm -hmm. So in the next chapter, we will see more of that. We will see the saint with two bodies who will um, perform a perfect miracle <laughs> uh, for us. And, and, and I love how Guruji just describes those stories without saying, oh yeah, this is like the greatest thing. It's like, oh yeah, so, so I met this guy and he is a saint mm -hmm. and he, he can be in two places at the same time. And, and um, there's a, there's a lot of um, significance to him and um, also having a connection with Lahiri Mahashaya because that seems to be a common thread in, in Guruji's life. Um, and I feel that this, this chapter is, is gonna be one of many in the beginning of the book where he describes his encounters with other saints until he meets his guru finally. Nice. All righty. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks for that. Um, and to the listeners, if you do want to get ahead, it's some homework. If Priyank was here, the disciplinarian would be giving you homework. So I'll do I'll do that. <laughs> um, he uh, he would probably say, you know, re re read ahead. Um, well, I don't know what he would say. I'll, I'll say I, I would suggest to, to read ahead. I think maybe as homework, you know, um, take the first chapter starts you know father i promise to to return home um we are going to aim it's not set in stone but we'll aim to cut it at the last sentence that said he glanced at the letter and made a few affectionate um references to my parent we're probably going to stop up to there so Typically, you know, what we do is we try to go through, get talking points, and then expand on each and try to, you know, work through it bit, bit, bit by bit. If you want to go through and think, you know, yourself, what talking points would you have? You can join us on that endeavor uh, and, you know, have fun that way and pull out bits that you think are interesting. And like I said, if we skip bits that you think are interesting or pull out and, you know, you want to flag those two, please do. Or if you just want to go along for the journey and, and listen in and have, have fun that way, feel free as well. Uh, don't worry about the homework. You may have enough on your plate as it is, but that's that's there op optional for, for those who want to. Um, I, I suppose just to recap then, uh, we might actually do go back to what I said at the beginning. There's so much of a footnote as um, Mike alluded to earlier, uh, footnote number six, it's like a whole coverage um a whole special episode uh we may do then or we probably probably will do um in in a, a short time so look out for that special episode um and check it out the footnote number six uh that's coming up next um so you can you can have a read at that as well we're going to cover that in a separate episode in case you're wondering why didn't we go into that in more detail we will uh we'll try to cover everything that we can so with that said, anything anything else uh, from you guys? Anything you'd want to go into before we call it a day for this episode? No, that's everything. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you to everybody for joining us uh, today. Jai Guru. Till next time. Jai Guru. Jai Guru.